to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine Podcast Radio. You're about to listen to a new episode of Audio Signals. Get ready to take a journey into the known, the unknown, and everything in between. Recorded at no specific point in time nor space, ITSP Magazine's co-founders Marco Cipelli and Sean Martin follow their passion and curiosity as they venture away from the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society to discover new stories worth being told. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. There we go. Marco. Sean. You know, it's... Uh, it- we, we do quite a few of these episodes on audio signals and uh, some some are pretty dang meaningful and today's topic I think is, is one of those for sure and yep. uh, as people listening know audio signals is a place for you and I to kind of step out of the world of technology and cybersecurity where we our brains kind of go a certain way and we always connect things to society but audio signals really gives us a chance to break free of, of the tech piece and really look at the human element of, of where we live and how we live and why we live this way. And, Although uh, I have to say, Sean, as hard as I try, yeah. technology usually find their way back, either through the window, the there back is. door. I mean, that's, that's our society, <laughs> right? I mean, my even my my uh, channel, my own podcast is redefining society. And, and of course, even this topic that we're about to talk today is, of course, a societal topic, uh, psychological, historical, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, social media and the way we interact with each other may actually come into the conversation. But this is not why we're here. Uh, people that are watching the video, because at this point, podcast means also video. I, mean, I, I don't even you know, uh, make a difference anymore. Uh, they see that there is Braden Anderson with us right here. And for those that are listening, you're going to hear his voice right now. How are you doing, my friend? Marco, Sean, great to meet you guys. Pleasure to be here on Audio Signals. Excited to engage in some thoughtful dialogue and, and share some stories. And I understand that you had uh, quite a story uh, to the point that you even uh, wrote a book about it. So, um, Let's just start with you. Who who are you, and uh, how did you get to write a book? And of course, you don't have fifty hours, so make it for sure. For <laughs> sure. And, and I think with some of these things, we'll we'll unpack it. But um, you know, generally, uh, I'm somebody who who grew grew up in Calgary, Alberta. Um, it's a small ish town, um, you know, in Western Canada. Um, I grew up in an abusive household. It was it was tough. I, I dealt with, you know, abuse at home and, you know, ended up being homeless for a period of time. Um, in addition to that, dealt with a, a fair bit of, of, of racism, both, both physical and, and, and emotional and, and systemic, um, and was able to overcome those things to, um, to play NCAA ball, to become the first person to play NCAA basketball while in law school. Um, I then, and you know, obviously naysayers then, right. You, you have people who don't believe in you along the way. Um, but you know, ended up landing a good job at, at the largest law firm in the world. And I represent banks, public companies in connection with government investigations, uh, typically brought by the department of justice, uh, or the sec, um, and also public company and, and large private organizations, uh, in, in, in connection with internal investigations, right. Um, you know, big public company investigations typically supervised by the audit committee. So that, that kind of stuff. Um, really enjoy it. Uh, in addition to that, right, wrote a book called Black Resilience, right? And and that's really about black empowerment and, and putting the focus on what people can control. There's so many things in our environments that we can't control. And so without putting down other movements and putting down other points of view, it's really about saying, hey, we haven't focused enough on this one right? Let's focus on what do we have um, at our disposable, uh, at our disposal, and what are, if we took inventory of the things that we can control, what are those variables? And just focusing on that. And that's really what I believe has been helpful and successful for me. And so uh, 
this is this book is is really a, a collection of, of stories, strategies, uh, strategies, ideas that that help me navigate and overcome not just racism but uh, lots of other forms of of adversity and um, and struggle and uh, you know just hoping that that can make a difference to to somebody else. Yeah, I love it, and I I want to stick with the the adversity piece for a moment before we get into the book and. I mean, Division One basketball, uh, law school, both of those are uh, significant uh, achievements. And it sounds like you had to, to uh, overcome some things to reach one or both of, both of those. And I'm wondering how, how, how did I, well, I guess what I'm really trying to figure out is, is there one that gave you confidence in certain ways that fed the other, that fed back to the other, or... Or did, how, how did you approach each, each of those and then also do them together at the same time? Yeah, I, I think you got to build where you are, right? For me, you have to take a snapshot in time. So I'm getting abused at home. It's really bad. Because of that, I'm probably acting out in school a little bit, right? I'm, I'm the only black kid in the whole school. So you can imagine, just listen, at worst, or sorry, I should say at best, Right. At best, the type of racism that you're going to face is, you know, he's not like everybody else. Right. Maybe you don't give him the same benefit of the doubt that you would give one of your other students because you just don't have the empathy there. Right. And it's a human thing. It's not like I don't put this angered blame on people who have been racist to me. I just I, I don't see it that way. I've thought enough about these issues that it's really, hey, if you're racist and you're treating me improperly, it's because you don't really understand me. You don't really understand who I am. You don't really get my identity. And I'm going to help you through that. Not because it's my problem to fix, right? Because it's my responsibility to fix it, but because I want to be successful and you're standing in my way. And if you don't understand me, I'm not going to get what I need out of this class, out of this job, out of this opportunity, out of this interaction, whatever the heck it is. I need you to play ball and I need you to kind of understand who I am so that you can properly engage with me. Right. Because people we're all just human beings. Right. And so when you have a teacher like in college, I had teachers who just didn't give me the benefit of the doubt. If I missed a couple classes because we we're traveling on the road playing games they would just give me a, a zero. They wouldn't follow up. They wouldn't say, hey, buddy, I know you were on the road playing a basketball game. Why don't you make up this quiz? They're not gonna ch they're not gonna chase you down, right? Because it was extra work for professors. And I started to kind of think through that that dynamic that, hey, professors aren't paid extra to deal with student athletes. That might be a pain in the butt. I bet you it, it would be really annoying if you had student athletes come in who think that they're better than the than, than you and think that you're that they're better than your your class and are missing all the time and maybe don't care a ton or don't seem to, to care a ton about the the subject matter that, that you're that you're teaching about that might be a pain in the butt and over years and years if you taught for 20 years or 10 years you may start to develop a bias against those student athletes pretty natural can't call that person the devil right if they over time develop a little bit of a I don't know. Those student athletes, literally, like ninety percent of the time, uh, uh, they annoy me and they really don't treat me with respect. Right? Like I'm coming in right off in a bad situation. Right? If I'm if I'm that next student athlete in that person's class, I need to have an awareness that this person has a life and they're a human being and they're not perfect. Right? And it is perfectly normal for over time them to develop some sort of bias. Now, what am I going to do about it? I need to be aware of this, right? Obviously, it's to an extent, right? If you do all that you possibly can, right? You kind of take the time to explain yourself, which I started to do, right? In class, I'd start to, at the beginning of, of each semester, I'd say, hey, I'm Braden. I'm on the basketball team. I don't know what experiences you've had in the past with student athletes, but I just want to let you know, I really care about your class. I selected it purposefully and specifically no guidance counselor made me take this i want to take your class i read your study about whatever it was it, you know and i thought it was really thoughtful when you mentioned this and i'd love to talk to you about it sometime you know when you have a minute 
And like, I would just totally change what they thought, right? Like they came in thinking one thing about me because I'm on the basketball team. And after that interaction, boom, didn't think about me that way, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, wow, this is not that kind of kid. And so thinking about situations like that, you guys, like that's kind of what it's all about. And every single breaking, you know, breakthrough or checkpoint in my life, there's essentially a, a you know, a step-by-step -step pattern of me doing something like that, right? In that situation, that's what the book's about. So uh, I agree with everything you said, because I, I don't think sometimes it's uh, people are per you know, on purpose, evil, right? It's just you are part of your society, your community, your culture. And unfortunately, there's a lot of work to do there. But I'm also wondering, like, you had developed this strategy, which which I love, very similar to my own strategies as a student, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. uh, to like, you know, let me, let me go forward with this. Have you had somebody that inspire you to either, you know, I'm not going to say a mentor, but I don't know, reading books or somebody that you looked up and you're kind of inherited this kind of strategy or way to present yourself to overcome the problem that you were had. I think for me that there's a couple of different things that, that happened to me that, that really set me on, on a good path. Um, one of the first things like during a really difficult period of my life where I was struggling with, with homelessness and abuse and, and really the outlook for me in terms of my life and, and having success, it didn't look good, right? Like if you were a betting man and, and you were taking a look and you could kind of see my life as a movie, um, me at 12, 13 years old, you'd be like, not going to be an attorney. <laughs> I'll put my life savings on it. Never. That's not going to happen. Right? Like, I wasn't even on path on the path to graduate from high school at, at certain points. Right. And so um, there was one thing that happened to me. Um, I went because um, I didn't really have a dad to go to take your kid to work day. I went with one of my stepdad's clients to take your kid to work day. Um, and his name's Martin and he was a developer in Calgary. And really, really successful, right? Like definitely at that point in my life, the most successful person that I had met or interacted with, right? And at the, it was a really great day. He was really kind. And at the end of the day, he gave me a book that his mentor had given to him. And, and the book is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I, you know, I'm 12. I don't know how well I can really read at, at that point, especially a, bit, a big, thick book like that, like in terms of like comprehending everything that it's saying and being able to apply it. But I read that book once and then I read it again and I read it again and I read it again. And I think by like the third or fourth time of reading it and like Googling words I didn't know and like whatever, I had a good solid grasp on, on what that book meant. And it really, to me, and it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but for me, it meant that I did have some control over what happened to me that even if it was kind of crappy that I was born into circumstances where we were poor and I'm getting beat up every day by my stepdad and it seems like my teachers don't like me and yada 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 and I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight I have some control in the matter that hey what do I have in my life what do I have? Like, if there's one thing, a talent, a skill, a sliver of an opportunity, what is it? And for me, like, it was a very objective thing. A lot of people, basketball for them is hoop dreams. They, they love it. They just love the game. They just, it just happened to them. For me, this was literally life and death. For me, this was, am I going to live or die? And I looked in the mirror at the time. 13, 14 years old. I think I was about six, three or six, four already. And I was a huge guy. Right. And I had the ability to, to play basketball a little bit. And I reached the conclusion that basketball was the best opportunity that I had, uh, best asset tool that I had at my disposal to get myself out of my terrible circumstances. Right. Because I could earn a scholarship to go to college and, 
and I could right use that education to be a doctor or become a lawyer or do anything that I could get myself out of poverty this way, that I could get independence this way. And uh, ultimately, it ended up working out, right? But there was a lot of things in between. And I want to, before we uh, went on air and started recording, you talked about the, the, the limits in the DNA of, of communities where just by default, I guess, you have a mindset and a way of thinking and, and an, an environment that surrounds you that says, this is about as far as you can go. These are the paths that you can take. And I mean, basketball, an obvious path, but you didn't stop with that. You looked at where can I get a scholarship? How can I get a scholarship? You connected that to, to, uh, to law. Um, how did that all form? Um, how, how did you break through that limit, those limits that you, that you grew up with and thought about? Were, were there people there to help you, relationships that you built that, that kind of showed you what's possible or how did that look? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple different things. I, I think ultimately that journey of unlocking, you get to different levels, right? And at first, just going to college is a dream come true, right? And so you get to that spot where now you're in college, right? Wow, what a great opportunity. And so at that stage, you think, how do I leverage this opportunity to the very greatest extent possible, right? And, and being a student athlete and what have you. And I think what the biggest accelerator was for me, while I always cared about my academics, at least by the time that I got to college, um, I broke my neck in a car accident um, about a month before I was going to debut in my first full season. It was a couple months removed from being at the Canadian Olympic team camp all summer with Steve Nash and, and a lot of heavy hitters, right? A lot, if not most of my AU teammates, uh, now play either professionally or in the NBA, right? And and certainly, I think literally every single person at that camp other than me uh, is currently a professional basketball player, right? So I had really great opportunities to play pro um, and then broke my neck in a car accident. We were hit by a drunk driver, um, terrible situation in the hospital for a month and a half, have to learn how to walk again, Right. Um, and that situation, I think it, it's a, it might sound a little cliche because it happens to athletes frequently, right? Well, you'll you have this injury, you have this thing that happens, and you're like, "Wow, I was so close to losing everything, right? Like, what else do I have? If I get hurt, what value do I have to the world? Who will people still care about me?" And I think I noticed really quickly how different people will treat you when they're not sure if you're going to be useful to them anymore. And it was really scary to feel that, to be like literally helpless. You can't even walk and you can overhear conversations and you can see the way that, that your coach might be talking about you or thinking about you or, or kind of moving on, thinking about the next guy, just kind of moving forward and how quickly that happens it's, it's scary. And so I think for me, that was really, really <laughs> powerful uh, in, in kind of making it clear that I need to leverage this opportunity. And right now I'm not getting paid, right? That's the other issue is the amateur system is that like that can happen to you and you could be very valuable to an ins institution or an organization for a, large, a long period of time and generate a lot of value and have nothing to show for it potentially, right? And so I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen to me. And the way that I saw it, although I wasn't being paid in dollars, I was being paid in education. And so my new goal once I broke my neck was I wanna be the highest paid basketball player in college of all time. How do you do that? It's simple, it's a credit system, baby. The more credits that I earn, the more value, the more money, I'm extracting from this university. And so I wrote letters. I did whatever I had to do to take the most credits that I literally possibly could. I broke all the rules in terms of the limits of how many you can take by kind of pleading with, with the administrators uh, to let me do it. Uh, why? Because I wanted to make history. I, I told them I want to graduate early. So I have a couple years of eligibility left so that I can use the graduate transfer rule 
to play wall in law school. And of course, like everyone was laughing at me right right away because they're like, no one's going to let you do this. Right. I actually had a, a meeting with my coach um, where I was kind of explaining to him, hey, like I want to do this thing and I'll never forget it. He he laughed in my face. So, Sean, sometimes it's not the the, the mentorship uh, as much as it's the naysayer. It, we're all motivated in different ways. Right. And, and for me, him laughing in my face, like I literally wiped s- spit off my cheek and it was. It, it, it was really invigorating. I was like, wow, because I saw it for what it was, right? At the end of the day, this is a, an experienced guy who's been a coach for 30 years plus, who's telling me that no college coach in the country is gonna, will let you do this. And you have to have some humility. He's, he thought it was funny, right? And so in some ways, I'm thinking, okay, wow. So this really is going to be hard because a guy with this much experience thinks it's funny, so funny that he's laughing out loud in my face uh, at the idea that I can do this. And so instead of kind of shriveling up and going, oh, man, I guess I got to do something else. It became really clear that I, I needed to have a solid plan. Like I needed to do everything I possibly could in 10 times more if this was going to happen. Right. Because clearly that is a reaction that I'm going to get a percentage of the time. Right. What percentage is this? Is it 20? Is it 10? Is it 99? Right. Let's figure that out. And so I I went on a campaign to have as many conversations with as many people about this idea as possible so that I could get a good sense of what the arguments against it were going to be. I had literally thousands of conversations with people about it college coaches, assistant coaches, people involved in, on the law school administrative side, just random players, people in AAU, reporters. I talked to as many people as I possibly could. And it was awesome because I ended up with a repository of possible human responses to someone saying, hey, I want to do this thing that you've never heard of before. And it was it actually became very boring, you guys. Once I did this, it was, I never got a new answer again. After the first two, 300 people I spoke with, I got the same answers. They would recycle themselves time and time again. And so when I would have these conversations, their naysaying would like bore me. It was like, yeah, I've heard that one. I already have six ways to overcome that. So, and I wouldn't even always bother arguing back. I'd just be like, interesting. Okay. Anything else? Any other issues that you perceive with this idea? And I would just try to get as much out of them as I could. And, you know, ultimately I ended up really prepared to have those conversations when the coach is saying, why would I let you do this? Right? Because that was a big issue was how do I get someone to make this crazy, ridiculous goal that I have something that they want to do? Okay. You're making history. What's in it for me? Why would I let you do this? Right? And because of the conversations I had had, I was able to show empathy and say, listen, I understand why this is difficult because either I do this and you look really good or I mess this up and I make everybody look bad, right? And you say, listen, this is why we don't do this. This is why no one had done this before because it can't be done. And now we look silly and we look like idiots for allowing you to talk us into this. And I was, and I told them, I said, listen, I understand that. And I understand statistically, there's a reason why this hasn't happened before. But I can tell you that there's never been someone like me before. There's never been a person who actually has a plan, right, and has the courage and determination to do this and has the will to do this. And I think if there were a collective of people who had this specific intention and desire, right, your statistics would look much more different, you know, much different, right? And Essentially, it became a campaign to convince that person that I am the person who's going to do this and I'm going to make you look good. It's right. Like, I'm going to make you look good that you let me do this. Right. And we'll do the PR campaign around it. And, you know, don't get in my way. Right. <laughs> well, listen, I, first of all, I'm like, you, you were born to be a lawyer because, I mean, just the way you <laughs> approached it, they like research, interviewing people, and, and also an incredible kind of like PR campaign as you actually define it in the end. It's almost like a, a politician mission into, you know, getting the vote, right? I mean, that's, that's what I'm perceiving. 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So let me let me go into into your book because here, of course, listening to your story, the, the, even if it wasn't in the title of your book, the word resilience, it has to come out. I mean, honestly, uh, all the things you just say. So I'm trying now to figure out how are you translating this in your book to inspire other people because it seems pretty complex what you've been going through and many times as especially as a sport person i always say you know not all the good teachers are the best players or the best coaches you kind of need to have that right some people just say hey i i don't know how i do this uh, mm -hmm. i do it okay cool right. but other people are not the best player but they're amazing in inspiring yeah. and teaching others. So I'd like to know how you translate what you feel inside and, and, and how you're using the book, the strategy you're using in the book to, to pass it along to others. Yeah, the book really reads in, in a way that takes you through the journey. I try to not rush things. I knew that writing a book like this would be different than writing Think and Grow Rich, for example, a great book, right? Um, there's a lot of books that I have read and found helpful depending on where I was in life, right? And I wanted to write a book that really spoke to you no matter where you were, no matter what phase you were at in your journey, that you could read this, pick up this book, and it would meet you where you are. And so one of the ways that I do that is we start out really slow. We start out by just kind of acknowledging all of the problems because we have to move past them, but you have to take things slow. In the self-help genre, there's often a really quick and aggressive jump to here's the five steps and right here's the 10 things that you need to learn. And this is too personal and sensitive an issue for that. This is people's, this is generations of pain and trauma and anger and frustration. And people are sick and tired. People are upset, right? And so you have to have the empathy and understanding to go, I was upset. I was at that place. And I somehow got to the place where I am right now. And I still don't like the bad things that are going on, but I certainly don't feel like I am a victim um, of it and that I cannot escape my victimhood, right? I certainly define myself as, as, as someone who can overcome whatever is thrown at me, right? And how did I get to that place? And it starts by acknowledging this reality. And, you know, we kind of walk through, I had to overcome this, I had to deal with that. This was crappy. This was crappy to kind of build that rapport and understanding that I get it. I've been, here's what I've been through. I know you're probably thinking about 10 other things that happened to you just like it, or maybe worse. Right. And that really sucked. And we had, we kind of have to have that shared connection on what happened to us. Cause that hurt, right. It's the stages of overcoming trauma, right. From a mental health perspective, you got to work through the weeds before you can get to any 10 steps. And so first we really work through the trauma and say like, this was wrong, right? Like this, this sucks. And we really have to work through that, right? And then we get to this place where we're like, all right, so what do we do about it? How do we start? And it starts with identity because bias in so many ways is just this refusal to accept your projected identity and what you think you are and replacing it with something that is less advantageous for your personal success, right? We have to think about what do we want our identities to be? And that picks up, Sean, with what you were talking about earlier about the limits that people place. And so for me, it starts with taking each person and saying, like, what, did, what is it that you're good at? Like, what is it that you like? What is it that you want? What is your greatest hope and dream, right? And shoot for the absolute stars. Don't shoot for something closer, closer to earth because you think it's easier to get there. Right, because no matter what, when you set course for for a goal, it's there's going to be waves, man. There's going to be waves. It's going to be hard, even the easier route. It's going to be tough. And if you're gonna say to the person in the mirror, "I'm never going to quit, no matter what," it better be a destination that was worth it. 
it better be a destination that's worthy of all the blood, sweat, and tears that it's going to take to get there because you can't control that. Remember, you can only control what you do. You can't control how hard the path becomes and the things that are completely unforeseen that jump up to stop you because it's going to be there. So first, let's come up with this identity of of the goal identity. Who do you want to be, right? In the best possible case scenario, if there were no limits on what you could achieve, what would you want to do? And it takes some work to get that answer out of people because they protect it with a lot of deflection and denial about what they actually want, right? Because they think that they're protecting themselves by not trying to get too excited about something that's not going to happen. But when you really, really get, you know, down and dirty with folks on that stuff and the nitty gritty, people will eventually disclose to you, wow, well, you know what? I really would like to be a doctor. I really do. And I had always said I wanted to be a nurse because I thought it was more attainable because I thought it was really hard to get into medical school. And But actually, I want to be a doctor if, if I could. Right. And you kind of get people to, to admit to themselves first, hey, this is really who I would love to be if I could. And then you take them there. Right. And then you start to identify what are the variables that it's going to take to get there. What are, which of those variables can they start to if they can't control influence? Right. And what are the A, B, C, D ways of trying to influence it? Right. Because you can never rely on just one method. If you're saying I'm going to be successful no matter what. For every single step that you need to get to, you have to have three, four different ways of getting there, um, kind of ranked in order of priority, of efficiency, of ease, and you just kind of kind of roll with the punches, right? So that's where I kind of I start with the identity stuff, and then we move into tact, which is about uh, the empathy and, and conversations and kind of because sometimes again you can't control other people. But other people are going to be important. They're going to be important. It's not all going to be about you. Some of the goals that you want to accomplish, you're going to need other people to agree. You're going to need other people to say, sure, we're going to allow this success to happen for this person. And how do you get that done depending on what those circumstances are is is an issue. And then we move into some other things like being relentless, right? Relentlessly refusing to accept defeat, right? We talk about that. Um, We talk about overcoming, you know, uh, difficult circumstances with police. If you're, if you're in those interactions, we talk about uh, being a black parent in America and kind of how to overcome that. And then, you know, finally, we talk about building one community. We talk about, Hey, at the end of the day, we're trying to do all these things to overcome racism and, and, and navigate obstacles to be successful. How do we build one community? How do we stop this this polarization that that we're suffering from in this country and come together and, and love each other, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not just that, you know, I don't think it's productive to attack white people, right? I just, I don't think it's productive. I don't think it's going to work. It hasn't worked, certainly, right? Um, but it's also not the way that you build relationships. It's not the way that you make meaningful connections with people. You got to give people grace and empathy, and so the book is also about that. And it, you have a foundation as well. Um, and I'm glad you went to the identity. I was like, I wanted to pull that string a little For bit. Sure. You, you just covered it uh, perfectly from my perspective. Um, you have a foundation as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Does it does it kind of trans transfer from the book to in person type things, or what's going on with that? Yeah, so so the foundation is is about it's called the Black Resilience Foundation, and it and it's designed to help further the the message of the book, right? Of, of Black empowerment and, and and representation, right? Black representations of success, because one of the things that we can all agree that we saw a lot of in the last several years, especially during the pandemic and coming out of the George Floyd. Um, scenario was a lot of videos being um, being played um, that depict black pain and black trauma and a lot of really unfortunate, really disgusting, horrible videos um, that um, really um, 
perpetuate in a lot of ways the the stereotypes unfortunately right they're trying to drive awareness right so we all understand what the goal is it's to draw awareness so that people see it and say that's messed up we got to change things right but at the same time it's also creating this really negative and pervasive idea in our minds about what the outcome is for black Americans, right? It's this reminder to all of us, if you're black, you're reminded, wow, I live in this world where people might just shoot me. Why do I even try? It's really negative. Again, learned helplessness. It's not good for those things. It's not good for your mental health. It's terrible. And for white people, it's again, this depiction of black people that is, there are victims, they're not, you know, um, they're being persecuted, racism. It's just, that's not the, that's not the way black people want to be viewed right like we want to be equals we want to move on we want to be integrated we want to be human beings with everybody else and ultimately and i talk about this on in the book as well like when you when it comes down to appealing to human nature when let's talk about the hiring and promotion aspect of things right and and kind of the the relationship between diversity and inclusion and 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 the hiring process and racism and how all that works. If you're hiring somebody because you're filling a quota and because you need to hire X amount of black people this year, that's not good for the black person. That's not the situation. That's not the circumstance in which you want to be hired or selected, right? You want to be selected because you are the best person for the job. And in many situations, the black person is. And in those situations, we want to be hired. That's it. And the focus on black excellence and black achievement is how you start to flip the script and change the narrative about what it means to be black. What it means to be black isn't that you might get gunned down in the streets by a cop. It means that you might be an amazing lawyer. It might it means that you might be an amazing doctor. It means that you might be an amazing basketball player or hip hop artist or violinist or trumpet player or architect or hedge fund manager. It, do, it, it, it doesn't mean these stereotypical things, right? Um, and the only way that we change that is through representation and kind of putting on display instead of narratives of black pain instead of slave narratives, right? Emancipation, the new movie coming out. I'm not a fan. I'll just, I'm not. I'm not a fan of us continuing to obsess over the slave narrative. It's not helpful. And I'm telling you right now, if you were truly, truly, truly racist, you would like it. If you're truly racist, if you truly don't want Black people to succeed, you like that stuff. You like every depiction of, of Black people as being weak, as being persecuted, as being victims, because that limits us. That limits our communities in the way that they think about themselves. It's a constant reminder of how it might turn out for you and why maybe you shouldn't even try because this world wasn't built for you. It was built for someone else. It's this terribly negative spiral that, that keeps people thinking in a negative way. And it's just not in reality right? You can overcome these things. You can become whoever you want to become. No, it may not be easy. Yes, it's going to take a lot of resilience, right? And a special kind of resilience, a, a black resilience, but you can do it. And, and that's what the foundation is about promoting. And, and we're putting together uh, a platform that hopefully will eventually start to compete with TED. Uh, you know, the TED Talk platform, we, we want to put together a platform that sheds light on on black entrepreneurs and, and black thinkers and and um and, and puts it on you know the, the spotlight on them in a way that allows them to tell their stories and share their experiences of, of black resilience right and how they got where they wanted to go because um i know for me it meant a lot uh in a negative way i still overcame it somehow but like i didn't meet a black doctor growing up i didn't meet a black lawyer didn't meet a black accountant anything um, so I didn't have a good understanding of like what I could achieve having not seen it and heard the story of how do you do this while black? Because hearing the story of how to do something while privileged is something that you hear a lot. And a lot of people in the black community get really frustrated by, by that. 
right? Because it's it's not really applicable. It's like, well, that doesn't work for me. Like, so this is stupid. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It's just, it's a different path and no one's talking about that. And so what I want to do through the foundation is, is connect with as many people as possible, build this platform and, and help as many individuals truly as, as we can achieve their goal and their dream of, of becoming the best version of themselves that, that they can. Wow. So I didn't see the movie that you're referring to, but I absolutely understand how sometimes I don't like when movies or even book, right? Like the representation is like, look, this person, I'm not going to talk about just, you know, the color of the skin, but the gender, whatever it is, it's like this person made it despite everything else. And I'm like, you make it sounds more like the exception than the rule. Right. You're, you're saying this happened, but hey, this was a very rare thing. So I, what you're saying right now, it's, it's really inspiring because I can think in the back of my head, many uh, people that are inspiring others and that we don't talk enough about it, to be honest with you. So my question is, who, who is working with you on, on this? I mean, obviously, I, as good as you are, I don't think you're doing this by yourself. So who is part of this uh, foundation that, that you have? Who's contributing to it? Yeah, so my fiance Selena Gabriel is is, is helping me with it. Uh, also, um, my brother um, and, and a lot of folks in, in, in the family are helping. Uh, Michael Meadows, um, we, we have a really, really good team uh, of, of folks who we're coming together. We're still building out the foundation. Certainly, we're we're still kind of at the at the at the early stage of of building this thing out and getting where we need to go, um, and and you know applying for grants and and seeking funding and you know all those all those good things. Um, but you know it's it's going to be an exciting exciting year, right? So hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to add uh, you know a, a lot of really great people to the foundation as as we kind of get this message exposed to more people who are like, yes, I love that. I want to be part of that. I want to donate and support that. And um, I, I'm just looking forward to connecting with with a bunch of like, like-minded like people. Um, we're also going on tour. So I'm going on a book Yeah, tour. I was looking at that. I, yeah. A lot of places. What, what's the tour about? Where, you, where, where is it? What ha- What's happened there? Yeah, so we're partnering with the Black Authors Matter Tour. Mm. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's a really, really cool, uh, organization, uh, run by Nico B. Good. Uh, um, and he, he, he's put together a really great core list of, of, um, of authors with a, not necessarily a focus on racism, right. But just black authors who, who are experts in their field. And, um, he, he's built some really solid relationships. And so, we're going to do part of the tour with them. And then we're also adding some, some other spots just for the black resilience tour. But we're, so we're going to, and you know, the, the exact dates are on the website on black resilience book or black resilience foundation.com. Um, but we're going to Amsterdam, London, Paris, uh, Dubai, Nigeria, Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, and then about four or five different spots in the U S um, so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to just connecting with a ton of people and, and just, you know, spreading the, the good word of, of resilience. I love it. And I'm going to quickly go back to, uh, before we wrap, kind of go back to Marco's point of it, it, it shouldn't just be a rare occasion, right? And in, in the title of this, it's the blueprint for black triumph, which to me says, there, there is a path. There is a way. It's been done before. It can be done again. And I'm wondering how, how you communicate to those you interact with to help them kind of open their mind and, and think of things as, as possibility, um, yeah. both for their identity and the path. I think storytelling has been the most effective method of doing that for hundreds of years, right, Sean? I mean, that's why I think with movies like the like Emancipation that's starring Will Smith that's that's coming out soon, like it's a missed opportunity, right? Do we need to tell that narrative again? Do we need to tell that story? Haven't we heard that story of the slave, 
right? Haven't we heard that? Haven't hasn't it been told a million times? What if we told the story of someone like I don't know, Braden Anderson, someone who was pov- who was in poverty, someone who was homeless and abused and then became a lawyer. How about that? How about we talk about a modern day story of somebody who is overcoming something that we all deal with, right? Like, why don't, why don't we talk about that? Why don't we talk about people who became doctors? There's thousands of black doctors. Where did they come from? How did they do it? Let's put the mic in their face. Let's put them on a platform. Let's make them famous. Let's tell their stories. Let's talk about the stories of people who are succeeding right now, right, in in today's society, because that's what's going to be helpful for folks as they're kind of understanding and and, and grappling with their identity and who they want to become and what they can do. It's incredibly inspiring to hear somebody who you can relate to, who you feel in your heart. They get it. They get it. They get what I've been through. They understand it. I've been through a lot and it feels like a lot, a lot of people can't understand me, right? And there's a lot of people feeling that way. And when you either see a movie or you watch, listen to a good podcast or you read a book that tells a story that you can really relate to and you're like, you know what? I'm going to listen to what this person has to say because I think they might. It's crazy, but they just might understand a little bit about what I'm going through. And I think that, Sean, is what becomes super powerful is when you see that connection that you can make to the the author or the performer or the speaker who's telling that story or just the main character in the story. And you can say, you know what? I'm going to listen to whatever they have to say next, right? And then you have the opportunity to say, hey, just try this. Just try it, right? And see what happens. And that's all that I'm really asking for is for people to just give it a, just give it a shot. Read the book, give it a shot. And if you are moved by it, give me a call, text me, call me. You know, I'm, I'm happy to be a real person outside of the person who wrote this book. I truly care about everybody, right? And their stories and, and want to make a difference. And so I'm hoping the, the, uh, the foundation gives me that opportunity. I think the book, the foundation, everything, but most of all, I say you, your passion that you're bringing out here. And I completely agree with you. Most of the time is a lost opportunity when you have an audience. And I don't care if it's an audience of a million, two million or one person, because if you can change the life of this one person and either on a podcast or an article or even more on a Hollywood movie, let's say, that that matter. That matter a lot. And to be honest with you, I, I think, I hope that people listen to this and and get that little extra energy that they think to to make some changes. And and I and I really enjoy this conversation. I mean, I I would go on and on and maybe happy to bring you back on the show and, and tell us how things are going in a few months from now. Uh, one last question, and with that, we will wrap. Um, the future, what, what, what do you see the future? I, th- I think he's optimistic from your perspective. I, I can bet money on that. But how do you see accelerate, accelerating this change? I think just thinking about the message and what we've talked about here today, I mean, yeah. just imagine, right, in this country, if a million Black people read this book, right? Mm -hmm. What would happen, right? Out of a million people, what percentage would really get it, right? Maybe it's, maybe it's 200,000, maybe it's 300,000, but that's a huge, like that in and of itself would change the world. It would change the world forever, right? Like it doesn't take a lot in order to drastically change the current circumstances. In big law, there's less than 2% in big law, right? Which is defined by most people as like the top 50 law firms in the world. Less than 2% black. It's been that way for like 20 or 30 years. The statistics haven't changed in 30 years. So as much as we like to think that we're making progress, maybe in certain areas, maybe at certain levels, But at the top, things are looking pretty similar around here. 
And why is that? It's not that we're not making an effort and trying to hire more people. It's that it's not enough. It's not actually working. We're not integrating at the highest levels, the relationships, the perspectives, the strategies. It hasn't been successful. And so I know for a fact, if a critical mass read this book, it's it's not a plug for the book. It's, it's truly about the message. Um, it's It's this alone. I think this is the sole way forward, right? Like black resilience as a idea, I do believe is the sole way forward because we've seen that everything else isn't working guys, right? Like, aren't we all seeing black lives matter? Wasn't it supposed to like work? Didn't it just piss everybody off, right? Like, isn't everyone more angry now (laughs) as a result of black lives matter, right? Like people are further apart. People are so angry about black lives matter and how they spent the money and how this and that, And it's all this focus on black pain and it's this focus on black people being abused and this focus on blaming white people and you need to change white people. None of it was focused on the black community. None of it was like a huddle where we're like, hey guys, like this is messed up. Like, what are we gonna do? (laughs) We gotta, how are we gonna overcome this guys? Like we need to have our own huddle here. And to the extent that white people are involved and listening in, they're listening in, pull up a chair. That's what the book talks about. In the intro, I say, hey, if you're not black, love it. Pull up a chair. We're having a black conversation. I'm talking to black people the whole time in the book. But you're probably going to be able to pick up on a lot of this stuff. There's going to be a lot of messages in this book that are helpful for you that have nothing to do with racism. Some of them will be helpful to you because it does have a ton to do with racism. And it'll just be helpful information for you to hear this perspective because it's different. Right. Um, And so that's kind of, I think, the way that this should go. White people need to have empathy, obviously, for black issues and their part in how they can help, you know, either reduce some of some of that pain and reduce some of those problems uh, or actually make affirmative, uh, you know, acts to help. Right. That's great. You got to have the empathy to be able to do that. But when you start the conversation with, hey, it's your it's totally your responsibility to build this bridge because I'm the afflicted and you and at least your ancestors are oppressors. And so, you know, you start the conversation with, Hey, by the way, nice to meet you, Marco, but screw you. Right. Like that's not going to work, right. That's not going to result in a meaningful relationship and, and discourse, right. And conversation between us. And so, you know, that's what Black Resilience is about as well, is this really healthy dynamic, right, between Black and white people where it's like, hey, we're not going to make this all like your 1 million percent problem. But like, listen in, because like, you know, (laughs) you could help a lot. And, you know, we're not necessarily going to blame you for everything that your ancestors did. But like, listen in, that would be appreciative, right? So that's what I would kind of say as my message to white people is like, you know, the book is not about attacking white people at all. It, it will be very, very unique to read in that regard because that's not my angle and almost everything else is. Um, but it's in, a, it's in a way where we're having the conversation and we're kind of working out the issues. And, and sometimes those are issues that have been caused by white people. But it should never be kind of felt as a direct personal attack because this is not it's not about you know, the, the personal stuff, right? We're just trying to objectively move the ball forward and 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 reach a better place, right? Where we're a stronger America because we got a lot of really strong countries that we're trying to compete with. This is a different world than we saw 100 years ago, right? We need to be united to protect American greatness and to continue to be the best country on the planet and to compete with the other major national powers that are out there, we need to have a fully integrated, united country where it doesn't matter what race, gender, sexual orientation you are, we're American and we're coming for you. If you're the rest of the world, we're coming for you, right? Because we're united and we're a team. And I think there's not a lot of money in promoting messages like that. There's a lot more money in in separating people and having one team fight against the other. Um, but I hope enough people kind of are struck by the message of, of unity and kind of 
the reality of what we need to do to to bring bring our country together. It's, uh, our our brain waves are on the same same length here. <laughs> Brandon, I was thinking about this over the weekend. In fact, um, uh, I was watching a lot of uh, the uh, the FIFA World Cup and and just thinking people from all over the place, sport, born in one country representing uh, representing that country uh, even though they play in a different country's uh, professional team and i don't know it just it, it struck me that in all the news that that we need less division more coming together and and i'm going to do a little little uh, talk about the words here because we talk about resilience and, and I'm, i want to highlight that it, it's not survival resilience mm-hmm. it's the other word in, in the title of the book of triumph right mm-hmm. it's achieving amazing things and holding that and continuing to grow and uh, i mean you're you're totally inspiring in in that regard and i'm excited to read the book and to see the charity grow and i hope hope lots of people read and listen and absorb it and i i, I drove by a billboard the other day and i can't remember exactly what it was for but it said something along the lines of um billboards can't make a difference thankfully mm-hmm. we're not a billboard <laughs> uh, right they, they can present the message but you have to you have to actually take a moment to absorb right. the message and and do something with it so i hope those listening uh do that as well today and super inspiring for me Braden. and uh it's an absolute pleasure meeting you and hearing your story and, and uh hearing about your triumphs and uh and excited to see where things go for you Thanks a lot, Sean. And, and really just, just briefly on that point about billboards not making a difference. Like it's, it's interesting because I think books in, in many ways are the, they're still, even though we have movies now and there's so many different ways that you can consume content. I think just, I want to leave one important message about books. Books allow you, in my opinion, to, uniquely in in a way that we have not been able to otherwise replicate um, fully explain yourself and your idea, right? Like you, it gives you the opportunity to fully bake an idea, right? Where you are able to fully communicate the idea, where it came from, how you're feeling, what it's all about, right? Like in a way that you can't confuse it, right? Um, movies even like a lot of times they're really decent at it, but sometimes you can have two different people who kind of like interpreted what was said differently. Right. But with books, like, of course you can have different interpretations and different perspectives on, on what was said, but in terms of the, um, the authenticity of the message, you can really in a, in a clear and, and comprehensive way, um, make your message, Felt, right. And I, I really don't know that um, the concept of black resilience c- can be adequately really explained in a podcast or in a headline or in a blog. Right. It, it took me, you know, all whatever it is, 270 pages uh, to to say what I needed to say, you know, um, and I just I still appreciate the art form of, of books, I guess. Oh, wait, I, I agree with you 100 million percent. So we, we talk a lot about <laughs> books. So that, that, that was one of the reasons. And, and we are aware that R is a, is a tease, is an overview and, and an invitation. For sure. For, for that. And as many times we say, you know, we, we, we don't expect even to have answers in our podcast that sometimes are only 30 minutes. This was so interesting and lasted 58 already. But the point is more questions than answers like you know use your brain and then share and and invite others so again thank you so much for everybody listening there'll be uh links to to the book to your foundation to your website and your social media so people actually could get in touch with you share their their opinion their thoughts their ideas and uh and, and spread the word so thanks again it was a pleasure having you Thanks a lot, Marco. Thanks a lot, Sean. Great to meet you guys. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Audio Signals. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share itspmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. 
If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society, and some even beyond that.